adaptation. And although the title says materials adaptation and design, I think it's quite uh, logical for all of you, I think, that any kind of uh, ideas that we may have about changing, adapting our materials or designing our materials have to do with a concept of evaluating that material to see what its strengths and weaknesses are. So I'm going to be looking a little bit about um, materials um, uh, that relate to evaluation. So can I ask you, do you have a piece of paper in front of you, everyone? If you have, can I ask you for half a minute or one minute to draw something, to draw a design, um, to draw a design, uh, so any drawing, any kind of drawing, which for you represents your course book. And when you've done that, just uh, just type done or okay uh, in the text chat. I'm not going to ask you to share your drawings <clears throat> and I don't intend to embarrass anyone, but I just want to see how you depict what kind of image do you have about your course book in your mind? Okay, done. Okay, no has finished. So anybody else who has finished, just write okay or done. Just draw anything that comes to mind. When you think about your course book, what do you think? Do you think about big monster going like this? Or do you think about something angelic and beautiful? Done, great. More dance? Done, great. Don't say yet what you have drawn until we have a few more dons in the text chat. Just draw a little something, anything. Very good. Okay, I have a few people who have actually done a drawing. Uh, I'm going to ask you not to draw on my board, if that's okay with you. Um, and um, all right, we have someone who's being a little bit um, naughty. Okay, I'm going to show you um, some drawings that were drawn by other teachers. Tell me if you recognize anything that you yourself have drawn. Has anybody drawn a, a smiling face or a butterfly or a sun? Um, a bird, you've drawn a bird. Have you drawn anything that looks like a hammer or a passport or a tool? No. Has anybody, okay, these, these are drawings that I have collected from uh, talking to people the teachers in workshops and sessions on courses. And here's another collection of drawings that I copied myself and beautified a little. But some people envisage the course book as a sea, as a bridge from the language to the foreign language, as a candle that lights up the night, as a vehicle, it could be a bus, um, it could be a boat, but always a teacher is on the driver's seat. Some people see it as a crutch, yeah? Has anybody drawn a crutch? Some people see it romantically as a butterfly. Some people see it as a weight, as a heavy weight. A menu, as a holy Bible, I suppose. You might say the Quran in your case. I think, let me just clear the drawings again. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, some people see it as uh, a teapot that represents British culture and having a pot of a spot of tea at five o'clock, I suppose. Uh, so you see that different different teachers have different views of the course book and what the course book represents for them. So some people see it as something helpful. Some people see it as a tool. Some see uh, some people see it as the pillar of all wisdom. 
Mohammed, would you please stop drawing? Thank you. I'm going to have to, um, I don't know how to disable people annotating my screen, but that's fine. I, I can still delete stuff. So um, materials seem to have some positive uh, effects on uh, language acquisition, according to teachers, and they may have some negative impacts on language acquisition. So how materials, I'm going to just go through how they help language acquisition. And some materials, not all materials, okay, because there's materials that do not do anything good for the learners. They may provide a rich experience of different genres. So the learners are exposed to newspaper articles, to short stories, to poems, and so on and so forth. They may allow for the provision of different activities, lots of variety, and use of multimedia, because we live in a multimedia world where input and information comes to us in different guises and through different mediums. They provide learners, or if I could say materials generally provide, may provide learners with opportunities for guided or autonomous discovery. Well-designed materials nowadays have a lot of guided discovery activities, and they may also have uh, ways, uh, ideas for the learners to go off do their own little research to discover knowledge all by themselves. Uh, materials, good materials may provide opportunities for learner training, helping the learners to see, to learn how to learn or to reflect on their own learning processes and see how they can help uh, themselves become better learners. This process of introspection may be familiar to some of you as metacognitive uh, skills or meta, uh, focus on metacognition in materials design. They may provide extras for all, and we teachers need a lot of extras. We don't have very much time. We're not paid all that well. So teachers need a lot of support. So they don't have to reinvent the wheel, but they can find a variety of materials Many, maybe they can't use everything, but if there's a lot of extras, you will find something that will be of use to you. They provide, uh, they assist language acquisition by giving you a chance to personalize or to localize. And by localizing, I'm sure the, this audience, this particular audience, uh, may have experience of looking at materials provided for a Western world or for a Christian society, which you might have, some of you might have problems with. Are there any materials that you would like to use but can't use for cultural or local reasons? To say yes or no, type yes or no in the text chat. I think also, yes. For example, I know that locally, if um, if there is a church in a book, Greek people would not object. But if you, if the same company would produce the same version of the course book for um, the Egyptian market, for example, but it wouldn't have a church, absolutely not. There would be a mosque or there would be, in another country, there might be some other place of worship. And also, good materials look good besides, they, are, they look friendly, they're well laid out, they have good design, good colours, they attract the eye of the learner, and they, have, they leave a memorable um, impression. They are artistically pleasing. But uh, materials, uh, course books, all materials that we design, may also have a negative effect on language acquisition we make use material that really has a bad effect. Uh, for example, um, uh, the, these ideas are adapted from Brian Tomlinson's English language learning materials, a critical review. If you click on the link on this um, page, you'll be able to find the book listed on amazon.com. Some materials may inhibit language acquisition by underestimating learners. 
thinking, oh, they're not, you know, they're not clever enough or they're not old enough or they're not motivated enough. So they make, make things, they may not present a reasonable and good level of challenge for the learner. They may oversimplify things because of the fear of giving materials, too difficult material too soon to the learners. And uh, they might operate under what uh, Scott Thornbury calls the muck nugget approach uh, in the sense of um, a kind of limited language to little to small bite sized little itty bitty tiny bits of language, which in the largest scheme of things do not really, really make much sense. Magnetism is a, is, a, is a concept that is quite interesting to explore because McNuggets, if you know, if my, my chicken nuggets are prefabricated, small bite-sized, but also very, very artificial. They're, I'm not sure what bits of chicken live in them, but I wouldn't touch them with a barge pole. They also they may inhibit acquisition by creating an illusion of language learning in the learners. The learners may go away saying, yes, we've learned something today. For example, by using the PPP model presentation practice production, which is not criminal, but it's maybe the only, it's the only model of learning or teaching. And it doesn't have very much or very long staying power in the memory of the learner. It's like, you know, I've been there, bought that t-shirt and then on to the next good thing. Next time, very often learners do not remember a single thing of what happened in the previous PPP presentation. Activities may be too easy or not challenging enough, or they may be confusing to the learners. The course may confuse the learners by presenting too much or whatever is presented not being presented very clearly. Uh, I think also um, they can inhibit learning by boring the learners stiff with their blandness. In a research that I did a few years ago, uh, I asked uh, about the qualities of great teachers amongst my learners. I asked uh, more than 100 young learners to tell, to tell me what advice they would give to new teachers. And, and they wrote some really absolutely wonderful things, amongst which one of the best tips for young teachers that they had to suggest was, do not give us busy work. We have a life. Remember that. And also, finally, failing to engage their stu your students' creative and critical thinking. I don't know whether your course book uh, facilitates language acquisition or prohibits language acquisition. But the principles about materials design displayed, uh, you know, the bad and the good and bad effects of materials apply to both to course books and materials, which you may be designing yourselves for your learners. So in order to adapt material, we really first have to look and how to evaluate it. And there's a very long list here, which uh, you won't have time uh, to process like because the writing is very small. When I share my presentation or when you watch the video, you can spot, stop here and take a screenshot or maybe take a screenshot now. Um, and really teachers need to look at materials critically before uh, deciding to use them. Are they appealing? Uh, are they credible? Um, are they valid? Is there a sound education philosophy behind the material? Are they motivating? Are they valuable long and short term? Uh, how will the learners view them? How will their sponsors or their parents or their business sponsors see them? And so on. There are many very good uh, course book, textbook evaluation checklists. Um, and uh, if you Google the concept of textbook evaluation or materials evaluation, 
uh, you will find a lot of interesting checklists and particularly look at Ryan Tomlinson's book. The, uh, the best known name is Alan Cunning's uh, Worth's book, uh, which is uh, called Material Textbook Evaluation and Selection, uh, typically. And you will find lots of different checklists to look at your materials from many, many different angles. Um, but also you can create your own checklist of materials. And I'm going to show you as an example of a very simple one that I created for myself, because very often I'm not, I'm not, I don't have enough time to go through a very long checklist. Um, I have a blog post that I can uh, also report to you later. Uh, but I just want to show you for now the simplest checklist that I have ever created, if you're interested, which goes like this. It has four categories for checking. I love this. It's good. It's okay. It's not good. It really needs help. Okay. And the five uh, words, the five, six words that I have put in my checklist uh, uh, make the acronym, which is very easy for me to remember because checklists need to be remembered as well. Otherwise, you don't know what to, what you are thinking, you know, what to look for. Makes the word friend. Yeah. Do you like the idea of the material as being my friend? not something that I have to battle with, not my enemy. This is quite important because, you know, we, we don't have so much time for preparation. We're usually not paid for preparation, although being ethical people, we do it. So I want a book course which has fun activities, um, that has ideas for games. I wanted to bring reality into the classroom, in other words, I want to have some authenticity in my lessons. I want language that real people in the real world would use, not some kind of uh, odd sounding people. I want the course book ideology to be uh, something that I, I would aspire to. So I wouldn't want a course book that is racist. It has hate ideas. It has, um, you know, um, ideas, concepts that go against my beliefs and the beliefs of my learners or their families, I suppose. Because your, your clients, the parents send you their children and they don't expect you to um, actually change their thinking, but they want you to respect their thinking and their philosophy. So you need to be very careful about the ideological framework of your course book. I want a course book that respects education principles, the concept of discovery learning, the concept of metacognition, the concept of um, how people process input and so on. These are all the good things you will learn in your methodology courses, or we have learned them, or that you can further explore in your professional development, but also something which will take account of my needs as a teacher, my need for variety, for richness, for extras, and the needs of my learners for the different things we discuss that will help their acquisition. And I want a great design. I don't want something boring and drab, uh, something that the learner doesn't take pleasure in looking through. And this is my own design that I sometimes put at the end of a checklist when something is so irreparably awful that, you know, I will just simply chuck the material away. I couldn't find an appropriate, uh, a little more too. Um, okay. So choosing your course book, I'm sorry, it's, that's the title, the correct title. These are, uh, this is the book that I mentioned by Alan Cunningsworth. It's a Macmillan book. And the course book um, and the blog post that I suggest that you might want to look at that I wrote some time ago. Uh, it's a little bit of a biased checklist, I want to inform you, 
because there is a kind of communicative bias into built into the checklist evaluating that reflects me, my beliefs. So if you like it, please use it and um, and let me know if you liked it in some way. Uh, materials, I'm not sure that you are able, nobody will be able to read this one, but materials and this task design um, vary from approach to approach. So I would suggest you do some reading, background reading on the different approaches. And as you can see, each approach um, carries with it a theory of language, a theory of learning, some objectives, but some activity types in the activity type columns, and this is taken from des designing tasks for the communicative classroom by David Noonan, uh, which is a book I'm sure some of you are familiar with. You will find a good checklist of activities that you can associate with the different methods and approach approaches. Don't limit yourself to one approach. Don't just say, oh, I'm just going to use communicative language teaching or lexical or whatever. Beg, steal and borrow, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, is a really, really good recipe in the, this time that we're living through where we do not um, uh, bow to any particular gospel. There is no one theory of learning or theory of teaching, then I would say I will buy it wholesale. That's where I am situated. I am a lexical approach person because it doesn't work all the time. Or I am a grammar translation person because it doesn't work with everyone. It may work with a limited number of people, but not with other people. So be selective, be critical, be informed be knowledgeable. Um, when you produce or adapt uh, materials, there is a, a path that you create. And um, the, the, the straight line, the, the, uh, connect, the full line is the dynamic path. You begin with identifying your learner's needs, you explore the needs, you realize the materials, you think about the pedagogical issues and you produce them. And then you get the students to use them. You evaluate them. But at any one point of this process, there may be feedback loops and you may need to go back to the drawing board. But when you produce materials, think about how it's quite important to try them out before you adopt them fully. Um, I'm going to suggest to you just a few ideas today in the next 15, 20 minutes, which I have available. But not every idea that I share with you will be good for you or for your learners. Try it out, see if it works. Maybe see if you can further adapt it in some way. Make it your own, make it your own and, you know, you may come up with an even brighter, greater idea. The idea of adopting and changing is, is particularly important for materials design so that you have variety and range. Very often, adaptation of course books is a more viable solution than um, just using them as is. And we adapt because the page may be too clutter, there may be lots of busy work, there's very, the, there's not enough good priming material for the leading stage, there's no fun, no games, it's boring, the characters put you to sleep, the context, God, they're so goody good, but they're, and they're very bland, as I, I said earlier, and so that reflects to in involving the learners, finding out what the learners are interested in, maybe how old your learners are, maybe what the focus of your course is, maybe the stage or the lesson of the course, the time you have, if you have, for example, a 120 hour course, and someone gives you a book that takes 180 hours to complete, it's really clear that you really have to, to do some heavy calling. But now, whatever 
the case may be, there may also be directives from above. You may have a Ministry of Education that gives you instructions to cover certain ground. You may have a directorial study that says you have to cover so many units in week and so on. So you have to juggle so many balls as a teacher. Do you sometimes feel like a juggler? I know I do, I do. And obviously experience, you know, the need, the particular need of multitasker. I find myself that uh, another word for juggler, yes, very true. The result of adaptations, which I'm sure, you know, I'm going to go through this very quickly, is either the material shrinks, you chuck out whatever the, the dross, or you expand it because there's not enough and you need supplementation, or you chuck and add, throw away the bad stuff, bring in some better stuff, it stays the same length as before, but it means it's an improved version of the material you had. And the types of adaptation, I'm sure again, you know this particular um, kind of menu, you may use an activity earlier or later. For example, very often in course book, I see after the text is given, there is a list of words and um, there's a list of meanings that the students have to match them up. And this is a nice activity, it's very worthy. But then um, I, I see teachers um, who spend hours pre-teaching uh, the vocabulary, and then they do that activity as a check-in. Why, why not do this activity as a pre-teaching activity? Bring it to the top of your lesson and save a lot of uh, agony and anxiety about pre-teaching vocabulary, get the learners to try and match the activities, give them the answers, and then get them to use the words. You may combine one or two or three activities together, and you may also add, you may need to add or supplement. One of the most important activities uh, a teacher does is very often you have to modify an activity because uh, if you drop every bad activity in the book, it means that maybe half the book is not done. And then parents begin to worry and they say, well, why did you make us buy it? We don't have money enough to put food on the table. And here I bought my kid this book and you're not using it. Do you have that kind of reaction sometimes? So there's a way to make activities do what you want them to do. So be creative. Uh, sometimes some activities cannot be said, no matter whether you kill yourself adapting. So just chuck them out. To make materials more communicative, which is my next point, I want to uh, take you back um, to some of the principles that were um, listed in uh, a book called Communicative Syllabus Design and Methodology, uh, written by uh, Keith Johnson many years ago. I think it was 1976. It was the heyday of communicative language teaching. And, you know, you remember those days, communicative language teaching had to battle with grammar translation and audiolingualism. So there was a very good idea. There was some very good ideas to help teachers decide uh, so if you, in the real world, communication happens when we don't have all the information. You have some, I have some. Uh, you have bits of the information, I have other bits. And this is called, and then we need to put it together in order to complete the puzzle, okay? And that's that uh, Key John Johnson called the jigsaw principle. The second principle he mentioned is the um, information gap principles. We communicate because you have information that I don't have and we have a reason to exchange and share that information. The third principle is the information transfer principle, which means that um, information is not always recorded verbatim, 
but we transfer and codify it into diagrammatic form. For example, I, for example, if if you have a phone call, you don't write the words with a message verbatim, but you use a form, um, a telephone message form, and you jot down the name, the phone number, and the main message. Yeah. If I look at the label. Uh, on my top and on the back of my top, it doesn't have many sentences that say don't put in the washing machine wash I'm 30 degrees. Uh, uh, do not ring that that's not there, but there are symbols that give me this information so information transfer involves the learners in transferring information from the written to a diagrammatic framework or vice versa. In real life communication, we correct for content. We, if, if a mother sees a child saying, I can fly, mommy, and it's the child's on the balcony, she will not say, uh, she will not correct the grammar. She will say, you know, you cannot fly. This is not true. You will die. And finally, in the real world, if we don't get the message, we are penalized in some way. So understanding language in the real world makes us accountable for the correctness and the follow up. So if I am taking a message on the phone and I write the telephone number wrong, um, my poor listening will make the other person not find not not be able to contact the person who called them. If I read uh, uh, and use uh, a job adverb in the wrong way and I apply, I may not get the job because I didn't understand the specifications for that job. Sometimes this is um, uh, this principle is also called by some people task dependency. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of task dependency. In the language classroom, Uh, that has some implications in term in the sense that if you present a, a lesson with a rag bag, rag bag of disconnected activities, there is no scaffolding between the activities. One activity does not provide a stepping stone for the next one. But you know, you could walk in at any one point in the lesson and you wouldn't have missed much. But in a task account uh, dependent lesson, which means it has flow, one activity will lead into the next activity. I've added two principles of my own from general uh, communicative um, thinking, I think, the ego principle, people like to talk about themselves, and they have 100 million information gaps inside their brain because we don't know everything that the other person knows, and we communicate because we want to not because someone pushes us. So that means we have to create those conditions for learning. We have to split up the information. For example, if you have a text, cut it in half, give some, give some people some of the text, some people the, the rest. Share it to different students. That takes account of mixed levels of teaching. Uh, use charts, use tables and graphs for comprehension and production so that you can put to, into practice the information transfer principle. Create reasons for exchanging and sharing that information so that the information gap principle and the desire to communicate principle are activated. Um, use text highlighters, cut text, put your coffee mug on the text to make it disappear. But create, you know, create a jigsaw of information that they have to complete. Um, bring fun into the lesson, turn boring exercises into games, into competitions. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples, I hope. Exploit the paradox in that, in other words, make the learners have a laugh, say something silly because that's more memorable allow for creativity and improvisation to create a desire to communicate 
and let students change exercises, maybe put their names in the exercises or turn, turn, change the sentences in some way so the meaning of the sentence applies to them or their family. And the same for dialogues and for text. So that means personalize, localize, and create a desire to communicate. Be playful. Not everybody likes to be playful, but it does work. And the final pearl of wisdom, if, if there is any wisdom in what I'm saying, is to think about your lessons not as PPP models, but think about getting them to produce first, then see how real people in the real world uh, do it, understand, maybe through listening, through reading, maybe analyzing the language in the focus text or focus transcript, and then get them to produce some more. In other words, do task repetition. Are you all familiar with task-based language teaching, the task-based cycle? This is something um, that many of you will have learned possibly on the Delta level course, on the CELTA courses that people uh, follow. The main model of lesson planning that they learn is the presentation practice production model. But as you grow up and you grow into higher level courses, uh, it's a good idea to learn to develop your teaching skills and your planning skills into models of learning and shapes of lessons that uh, stimulate excitement, thinking, production first before you expose the learners to so-called language models. Some possible activities that you can use, I'm just going to throw them into your line of vision without very much comment here, to play games, to discuss, to do role plays, to improvise, narrate, and so on. Um, technology helps us because, uh, for example, this is uh, an idea for stories. Um, my students are going to, and that replicates the TBL cycle. My students are going to read a story uh, which some of these things happened, but I collected some images and first I'm going to get them to guess the story. I'm going to get them to tell me the story and then they're going to read the story. Okay, so first of all, guessing with images. Or another way of dealing with the same story is to give them a series of events and get them to decide in what order do you think these events happened? So again, they're guessing. I made this diagram here uh, with a link, so I'm going. I'm giving you some ideas about the technology I used. Then later, they can read the text and complete the flowchart for real. This is from a course book text. Instead of doing uh, using technology, also helps with generating ideas. And instead of uh, regular questions, uh, you can get them to work in groups and write questions that the text does not answer. This is to generate the paradox, fun, and get them to ask very funny questions. For example, in the previous story, the, the person went to bed, um, um, didn't say what, what time you went to bed but you get the students to write questions about maybe what time he went to bed, what color were his pajamas, this wasn't in the story, or what was his wife's name, because that's not in the story. Uh, what kind, uh, did any children in the class wear glasses, that's not in the story. And then after they brainstorm these questions, they present them to each other and decide which ones are funniest. If you wanna, do some creative writing later on, particularly with younger learners, teenagers who love the paradox. Get them to add these fun facts that they created, the answers to their questions, get them to rewrite the story by adding them to the story. I hope you like these ideas so far. There is not very much 
reaction. Give me a smile if you like some of these ideas, please encourage me, because I'm about to rush into the, like, the, the last five minutes of my talk. So this is an authentic piece um, that I pulled out of a newspaper. Uh, a man uh, just forgot his, the, the baby seat on the top of his car and just drove off. And he didn't realize, but, and the child rode on the roof for three quarters of a mile for the car seat, flew off, landed in front of the car behind. Luckily, the child was saved. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, the, it was saved and so on. So I got the students to write some extra questions about that. And then I got them to write a new text, adding their effects into the questions. What I gave them, um, I think I haven't really been able to paste this very nicely. I used Etherpad uh, CH, which is a great way to get learners to write, uh, to do communicative, uh, collaborative writing online. And you can see that there, these are two different students um, working on the same text and they are working. And one of them, when they write, their writing arms up shaded in brown. And the other learners um, writing is shaded in green, so they know who wrote which. They know, for example, here, Volkswagen, and the other person added the word car. And then he, this one added something else. So this is really great collaborative writing and using the students' ideas in a very personal way. Do we have, okay, um, story dominoes are also very nice. I. Uh, this is a great activity. You can do it online or you can do it offline. You can take some phrases or phrases similar to the story and put them across and the students can pick up and tell a little story uh, which, uh, in which they have to use the phrase. For example, if I draw the phrase, everyone was laughing, when it's time for my story contribution, I have to continue by creating some, some situation in which someone said a joke and everyone was laughing. And I have to use the words, everyone was laughing. So these are this is a great improvisation activity using language from the text. You can get students to write something uh, online as a great website, which calls, which is called foddy.com. And um, if you can click on that and get your students to make uh, something that looks like a real newspaper. This was written by one of my classes after they created the story in pre-reading, in pre-listening mode, where uh, a woman reported in a mystery way, they say this is learner writing, started speaking an unknown foreign language on television. She was reporting the news about the Grammy Awards, blah, blah, speaking the language. The linguists are still trying to discover this language. Some people say it's from another planet. In fact, the woman had a stroke on air and she was going da ba da da ba da da ba da But the students created this story from that. Um, I think also TBLT can be used very nicely in course book dialogues. You can say, you can get the learners to write conversations before you present the conversations. Give them the situation and get them to write 10, 12 lines of dialogue, either from the description of a situation or by giving them some other information and then listen to the conversation in the book and vote for the next one, for the best one. Here's another way of doing this. Um, uh, I put all the words of a, of a dialogue in a word cloud and I give them all the words and I say make a dialogue with these words and then I'm going to play you the conversation and you can see if you use the words well. It shouldn't be a very long dialogue obviously it should be a, a small one that they can kind of negotiate within class time. No. Of course, oh I'm so glad you said that. 
this is the dialogue that goes with this story. And I also created a video with, uh, from this story with my friend, Carol Rengba. And we created a video, which was this really lazy secretary who created this dialogue, who hadn't done a stroke of work. And, and you, you can get them, the students, to act it out. After they hear the actual dialogue, all their own dialogue can be acted out uh, by giving them some keywords. But acting it out uh, can be, it's a really nice activity to, do you have to get learners to act out dialogues? Probably you do. It's a good activity. It's a very guided and very safe kind of role play. But very often the students look like this. I use this visual to show them how boring they sometimes look because I tell them to read the dialogue lines as if they were frustrated and they look like Charles Bronson. Charles Bronson looked the same in every movie. He was dying, he looked the same. He was frustrated, he looked like this. He was confident, he looked exactly the same way. So you use something like that, maybe even this slide, I'm very happy for you to use it. It just took a lot of and uh, get them to use their own expressions to act out the dialogues of their course books, but using a different mood. So if they say the lines that they read in a guilty way, if, for example, the secretary might say, uh, the, the boss might say, have you done your, the, have you typed the letters? And the secretary might say, uh, yes, madam, I have. Or if she she says the words in a frustrated word, way, she might say something like, yes, madam, I have, and so on. So they learn how to use intonation, they use expression to be expressive because the English tone of voice has wide intonation contours. It's not just monotonous and flat. Use, um, get the learners to record their stories this is a great website, which I'm hoping you will explore. It's an American website. It's called VoiceThread, and it's created for children. So it's very, very safe. So I gave my students uh, some words and got them to predict a story in a task-based lesson, and they went online and recorded it. I'm, I'm afraid I don't have time to play the recording to you because I need to finish. Uh, and then I finally read them the actual story. I will upload my slides on SlideShare and I will post them on your, uh, I will send them to your, to the ladies in charge here. And I'm very happy if they share them with you. They're not posted yet. Okay, I'm, this is not, not moving. I hope I haven't done something. So you give me a moment. Okay, yes, I did. Something got stuck. Sorry. All right. Uh, finally, help your learners develop some creative and critical thinking and make them do some silly things. For example, this is a typical causative use of have exercise where the students, I suppose, you can have your teeth filled at the dentist, you can have your photographs enlarged at the photographers. But instead of doing that, I get them to write something really siri, silly. And I get them to write sentences like, uh, you can have your teeth enlarged at the dry cleaners. So, I mean, this is something they'll never forget. I'm sure not, not everyone likes this kind of silly idea. But, Teenagers love it because I remember myself as a teenager, the sillier the activity, the better I remembered it. Um, okay. Or if the, the typical find someone who can you cook spaghetti? Yes, I can. Can you cook? Can you speak French? Yes, I can. 
Get them to do something funny. Can you touch your nose with your tongue? Let's see it. Can you wink with both eyes? Can you name 20 colors? So make it a little bit more challenging and more creative. Creativity uh, doesn't thrive when things are easy and smooth and not challenging. It benefits from the paradox, is triggered off by what is unusual, strange, funny, and dies an untimely death when things get too normal, is sparked off by humor, and is revived by exaggeration, which is why a lot of students don't like course books because, you know, a course book character will be kind of wishy-washy lazy. They should be bone lazy, like, you know, they should be kind of almost dead. If someone is mean, they should be nasty because that's what learners remember most, particularly young learners. So, also, you can use exercises in the book. Uh, like this is a typical exercise where you, your brother phones you on your birthday. Yesterday was your birthday, but he didn't phone you. So he can't have, he must have. Have you seen exercises like this? Right, you have. They are in books. This is from a course book. But what I do is I get them to guess how I have completed these sentences, and they get a point for every answer, which is the same or similar to my answers. So there's a competition element there. How did the teacher answer? So let's guess. So kind of gamify your materials. Instead of doing a boreal drill, give them do a just a minute activity, choose a topic, and talk for one minute on your topic some of the questions your mother used to ask you, some of the clothes to use, you used to wear in your teens, how you used to spend your pocket money when you were nine. And adjust the questions according, obviously, to your age group. This was for a group of adults. And finally, improvise with course book exercises. This is a boring exercise for I wish you would, I wish you wouldn't. I wish you would phone me. I wish you had phone me. I wish you wouldn't lie to me. Blah, 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 blah. I, I don't remember. I wouldn't remember any of that as a student. Instead, get them to create a dialogue where one of them, there are, you can put them in three groups, and each of them is given a color. And at some point in the conversation, they have to say their line. So they create the context, they create the situation, they decide who they are, where they are, what they're talking about. So they're using language in context. The same here, another boring activity where they have to choose the word convincing versus convinced. Well, get them to create a dialogue in which each one of them has to use one of these two phrases. I had a group of teens doing that and they had to a great one with one of them trying to tell a very boring story about a car and then the other person started snoring and said you know i don't think you're very you don't look very interested and the other person turned around and said well i don't think you're very interesting you always talk about your car and that was a great conversation so i've come to the end of my talk make make sure your materials design um, integrates the language skill, mobilizes wide areas of language, includes some unpredictable responses, engages your learners, is creative and playful and collaborative, and you can't go wrong. So thank you, merci. Um, I don't know how to say thank you in your language, so can you teach me that? Shukram. <laughs> Shukram. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to say shukran and thank you to you, uh, Marissa. Very informative presentation, full of creative ideas and tips, uh, nice websites. Actually, I was blown away, especially that I'm a big advocate to creativity inside the classrooms. So thank you so much. And I'd like to uh, Sarah, invite you that. You. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. 
Okay, so I'd like the attendees uh, to invite them if they have any questions to share in the chat box, please. Please, and can you show your lovely face as well? Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, thank you. Come up on video so I can meet you as well. Any questions? If you, yes, uh, Ahmed, please go ahead. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Marisa, very much uh, for this nice presentation. I really enjoyed it very much. Um, I just wanted to say hi and ask you if you have a favorite course book. Um, not really. <laughs> I think <laughs> not really. I don't. Oh, I, actually, I personally, I don't use course books, but um, I mean, I don't. Um, 